think there's anything new uh, with regard to our service this morning, so let's uh, hear our call to worship from the book of Revelation, chapter 5. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and all that is in them, singing to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. The elders fell down and worshipped. Let's worship the Lord, and Mr. Joseph Wagner will introduce our first Our first hymn this morning, number 89, Come Down, Almighty King, help us thy name to sing. Number 89, and we'll stand.
pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who has given us thy servant's grace by the confession of the true faith, to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity, we beseech thee that thou wouldst keep us steadfast in this faith and evermore defend us from all adversities, who livest and reignest in one God, world without end. The epistle for today is Revelation 4, verses 1 to 11, and it's found on page 1218 of the The throne in heaven. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard, speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Cornelia, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. The gospel for today is found in John chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. It's on page 1052, 1051 and 1052. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with you. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How could this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept their testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses looked up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And for join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our Give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Give us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Denying us his kingdom and power and glory forever.
The faithful have been swept from the land. No one, not one upright person remains. Everyone lies in wait to shed blood. They hunt each other with nets. Both hands are skilled in doing evil. The ruler demands gifts. The judge accepts bribes. The powerful dictate what they desire. They all conspire together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright, worse than a thorn hedge. The day God visits you has come, the day your watchmen sound the alarm. Now is the time of your confusion. Do not trust a neighbor. Put no confidence in a friend. Even with the woman who lies in your embrace, guard the words of your lips. For a son dishonors his father, a daughter rises up against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Man's enemies are the members of his own household. But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Because I have sinned against him, I will bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case and upholds my cause. He will bring me out into the light. I will see his righteousness. Then my enemy will see it and will be covered with shame. She who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her downfall. Even now she will be trampled underfoot like mire in the streets. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word this morning, we acknowledge the darkness of our own hearts and our slowness to understand the things you have for your people. We pray for the help of your spirit that he would illumine our hearts and open our minds that we might receive the truth as it is in Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen our faith in him and quicken us that we might live before you in a darkened world. We ask for your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen. On about Thursday of this week, the uh, jury was deadlocked in their decision as to whether John Edwards, the uh, pretty boy American candidate uh, for presidential office, was guilty of various... Uh, crimes against uh, the election law. Did he misuse funds that were contributed to him for his campaign and use them instead to hide an illicit affair? Mr. Edwards has become uh, the butt of many jokes. He is despised by many, not simply because he's had an affair, but because he had it at a time when his wife was suffering from cancer. In any case, the jury was deadlocked on five counts. They did come to an agreement on one count. When they presented their uh, deadlock to the judge, the judge said, well, you need to go back to your jury room and work at it a little bit longer. I remind you that the lawyers have gone to great expense to present this case to you. Uh, there have been uh, all kinds of taxpayer monies set aside for this case. You need to come to a decision. Well, they couldn't. <laughs> and Mr. Edwards was acquitted on all counts and released. Many of those in the media and uh, within the lawyer, the, the legal community as well, questioned the wisdom of bringing this case in the first place. The evidence seemed to be rather slight, and uh, it seemed to be a, a fruitless endeavor. And so it was. A great deal of effort went in, nothing to show for it. Sometimes when we look at various situations in life, we see that a lot of effort has been put into something, 
and we have nothing to show for it. We've worked hard, we've labored, we've engaged in all kinds of uh, efforts to accomplish a good goal, whether it's pursuing justice, providing good or uh, help for others. And yet, at the end of the day, when we evaluate all that's been done, we see no fruit, no evidence of a good response. And when that occurs, how do you feel? What do you think? Do you give up hope? The prophet Micah was facing a similar situation here in the seventh chapter. His sermons have uh, not had perhaps their intended effect in the lives of uh, those who were gathered before him. He had hoped that there would be repentance. He had hoped that there would be a change. Perhaps there would be reformation within the society. He preached earnestly, diligently, difficult subjects. He confronted sin in high places. And he was explicitly clear as to what the problems were and what God's demands were for change. But there's no evidence of any effect of his preaching. Micah compares himself to, the, uh, to those who dress the vines in the vineyards and they go out after planting the vines and, and watching them grow, and fertilizing them, putting them up on the strings so that they stretch out and expand and is anticipating that great fruit uh, developing on those vines. But when the time is ripe and there ought to be fruit, there's little to nothing there. I know that experience. In my father's house years ago, I planted some grape vines and they grew along the fence line. They spread here and there, had beautiful leaves to them, and then the clusters would begin to develop and there'd be very little grapes to show for them. Nothing. The biggest of them got to be about so big. Nothing. Disappointing. I was not meant to be a farmer. <clears throat> Micah expresses his deep frustration as he looks not simply at the grape harvest there along the hillsides of Judea, but more specifically at the spiritual life of those who are within the covenant community. I remind you that he's not looking askance at the nations of the earth, these idolaters, these wicked nations who are given over to their own corruptions and mourning over the, the evils that he sees there. He is talking about the covenant community of the Lord, those who receive the promises, those who have received the covenant under Moses, who had the Mosaic leadership and all the blessings of the Davidic uh, rule. These who had all these many spiritual blessings, nonetheless, as he looked at them, were corrupt through and through in every segment of society. He focuses very much in the course of this prophecy on the wealthy and the powerful, those who were in charge of the, of the life of the community. And indeed, the responsibility principally lies there. But the whole community was corrupt. It was hard to find any godly people. He looked through the whole community as a vine dresser looking for a cluster of grapes. Where is there a synagogue of godly people? Where are those who gather in the temple services who truly believe in the promises of God and are waiting for the Christ, who are repenting for their sins and faithfully bringing their offerings before the Lord, resting in His provision of grace? Where are these people? Micah could not find them. And what we see Micah grieving over the sad state of, of affairs there in Jerusalem and throughout Judea, when we feel the agony of his heart as he looks at his, the conditions there, we should not simply see a lone prophet upset over uh, lost spiritual conditions or the ineffectiveness of his own preaching. Rather, we see the Spirit of Christ who evaluates his kingdom, who evaluates his people, who himself mourns and grieves over the corruption of his people. Isaiah the prophet uses similar language to describe the people, speaking of how God comes and looks for grapes, but he finds thorns. He 
does not find anything helpful, fruitful, nutritious. Nothing but barrenness, waste, shriveled samples of vines. Many years later, Christ himself would enter the very same area, Jerusalem, Judea, and describe the great corruption that he saw in that day. One of his parables was a parable of the uh, tenant farmer who has a, a, a fig tree. And this fig tree has, for three years now, not produced any fruit. The owner wants to come and chop the tree down and plant another tree. Luke chapter 13. But the, the, one, the, the tenant farmer says to him, Well, my Lord, let me uh, dig around a little bit, put a little more fertilizer, and give it another year. The owner says, okay. What is Jesus intending to say? As he looks at Jerusalem, as he's come in his ministry for several years now and proclaimed the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. But by and large, there's been a lack of repentance, a lack of change. People have had a variety of expectations. They've gathered around it because they've seen the miracles. They wanted to eat free food. They liked all the blessings. But the real hard work of repentance, turning from sin, and embracing Christ as the Messiah, God's Messiah, not their own fictitious idea of what the Messiah would be. There's precious little evidence of that. And so... Patience was called for. A little more time, a little more fertilizer, a little more preaching of the word. Maybe in time, a good harvest will come. What did Jesus find? A year or so later, he comes to Jerusalem. He enters into the seat, the city with shouts of Hosanna to the son of David. But he comes into the temple and then has to clear the temple because of all of the uh, transactions that are taking place. The temple is being polluted by the corruption that was there. And as he goes out from the city, he sees a, a tree and he wants some fruit from that tree. It's not quite the season for figs, Mark records in this gospel. I think it's, oh, I forgot the chapter, 13 maybe. He, he doesn't see the figs, and so he places a curse on that tree. The next day the disciples and he are going back to the city of Jerusalem, but what has happened to that tree? It's withered. Now this is not just simply a matter of agriculture, or not simply a demonstration of Christ's power over the fig tree, or how he was upset with the fig tree. Some people look at this with uh, questions and say, why did he get upset with the fig tree? It wasn't even the season or the time for figs. How can he blame the tree? Well, he's looking for that first ripe fig that would come in anticipation of the greater produce. In any case, the point here is not simply a problem with the tree, but a problem with Israel as a whole. And this Christ would be bringing his judgments upon Jerusalem in the days to come. And he would tell the, the disciples who were marveled at what he had done here at withering the fig tree, well, if you had faith, you could say to this mountain, and what mountain was there before them? The mountain on which the top was Jerusalem. You could say to this mountain, go and be cast into the sea. And it will be done for you. He was announcing the judgments of God that would come eventually in 70 A.D. Christ is one who evaluates his church, examines, looks for fruit. Is there fruit among the people of God? We've seen that in our studies in the book of Revelation, the first three chapters. Christ dwells among the churches and he evaluates them, looking for spiritual fruit. He's the vine dresser, he's the vine. We are his branches, we need to bear fruit. If we don't bear fruit, we will be cut off. So Micah, looking at the generation of his day, 
is frustrated by what he sees. And we can share that when we look at the broad expanse of the Christian church today and see so much apostasy from the Christian scriptures, the skepticism that has occurred in many congregations, and a pursuit over a humanistic faith that exalts the word of man over the word of God. Where is the spiritual fruit? Where are the people of God? Micah talks about what he sees, how the faithful have been swept from the land, they've been subject to persecution within the covenant community of God. The godly are being persecuted within their own house. Not one upright person remains. Everyone lies in wait to shed blood. They hunt each other with nets. Not a flattering description of the moral condition of the people of his day. Micah is very much at home with Paul's description of our human nature, how it is, how we are children of wrath, how we are unable to do any good thing. There is a corruption here that abounds. We describe it as total depravity. Both hands are skilled in doing evil. Uh, they are using both hands, and both hands are trained. Some of us favor one hand over the other. The right hand might be a little bit more effective at doing some things, the left hand not so. They are skilled, they are ambidextrous with both hands, doing great evil. Rulers demand gifts, judges accept bribes, powerful dictate what they desire. This brings a point to what Micah has been saying throughout his prophecy how those in high places have been corrupted and bring hardship to the people of God. The best of them is like a briar. You try to embrace them and you get cut. You experience a great deal of pain. So, Micah gives counsel to the people of God. What should you do in a day like this when you see corruption on every side? When people abandon God's word, when they embrace wickedness, when they pursue their own gain. What counsel is there? Micah gives very, uh, pes a very pessimistic word of advice. Do not trust a neighbor. Don't trust anyone. Somebody who's lived right next to you for years and years, don't trust them. When things get tough, they will turn on you. Put no confidence in a friend. Such is the corruption of the community at large that even your friends cannot truly be trusted. Even with the woman who lies in your embrace, guard the words of your lips. Even that closest of relationships between a husband and wife can be divided by sin. And so Micah counsels the people of God and the people of that community to be discerning in their relationships with others, to recognize the condition of the day and not just simply look optimistically at what people are going to do, but be cautious. It's hard advice to accept. We want to embrace people. We want to trust that they will do the right thing, the good thing. But sometimes we can't do that. And then Micah goes on to describe the deterioration of the family unit itself. A son dishonors his father. A daughter rises up against her mother. What a sad commentary on that day when people raised up their children, perhaps took them to the temple to learn of God and His ways, and yet they all went off and abandoned the true faith and pursued their own ways, and then even rose up against their parents, dishonored them in many ways. I thought to myself this past week what a horrible thing it would be to have children rising up within my family, not embracing true faith, not serving the Lord, but going off and departing. It's there will be a great heartbreak. There will be divisions between a daughter-in-law and her mother-in-law. Perhaps we don't question that anymore. That's to be accepted. <laughs> there are these kinds of conflicts. But thankfully, in many of our families and churches, we, we, 
we don't have that kind of conflict. But uh, a man's enemies are the members of his own household. That's a very sad state of affairs that has occurred. This is what happens when you abandon God's word and faith in the scriptures. You abandon the word of God, then all that's left is deceit, malice, grasping after things for yourself, an unwillingness to seek that which is good in others, or to do that which is helpful for others. You should listen to the word of the Lord and trust in Him. And that's the advice that Micah gives. He confesses his own faith in these perilous conditions, in these difficult times, when there's so much corruption around him, Micah says, As for me, I watch and hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. He looks above, looks to the heavens, to the God who has redeemed him from his sin, who has brought him to himself. He waits for this God. He understands that it is God's will sometimes to allow this corruption to unfold within His covenant community. God is willing to allow this to test His people. Will they continue to trust Him when there's so much to be frustrated with, so much to grieve and mourn over, so many reasons to think that our labors sometimes are just not worthwhile. In those circumstances, those who are godly watch in hope for the Lord. They continue to look to the Lord in prayer, seeking His face, seeking His blessing, knowing that this God is their Savior, the one who alone can deliver us from sin. And they have confidence that God will hear. Have you been in circumstances when you've been challenged to your very core? When you've been frightened with regard to your future, your health, your, your, your financial well-being, your family's well-being and safety. What did you do? Did you turn to the Lord and seek Him in prayer? And seek earnestly His help? This is the response of the godly. And they have confidence that God will hear. God will listen and understand. He may answer you in ways that are not what you expect, but He will hear you, and He will answer you, and provide help. Look in verses 8 and 9. Now, Micah expresses his faith in, in God and His deliverance. First, he admonishes those who are around him, those who were doubting and skeptical. You know, look at the, the broad church today, and those who question uh, faith in the scriptures as the word of God, who, who question it as inspired and inerrant, and they question your faith in the true God, they, they mock you. Micah says, don't gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. They may see us in sin. They may see us do things which are disappointing to ourselves and an embarrassment to others. They may mock and they may laugh. They may see you struggling in life and having a hard time getting by. And saying, where is the God that you trust in? Where is the evidence of His help? Though I have fallen, though my stocks have gone down, though my bank account is very thin, though I don't know where things are going to come for me in the future, Though I have fallen, I will rise. Micah sees that he is a part of the resurrection community of the Christ. We are those who are united to one who has risen from the dead and ascended into heaven. And so, joined to Christ by faith, we too experience the power of the resurrection in our lives. And though we stumble and fall in many ways, Nonetheless, there is that powerful work of grace within us that causes us to rise up once more to pursue godliness, faith, and the triumph over the things of this world. He will bring me into the light, and I will see His righteousness. Or, the beginning of the verse 9 says, Because I have sinned against Him, I will bear the Lord's wrath. Here Micah recognizes that the problems that I experience in my life are my own doing. 
I may not have done what the community around me is charging me with, but I have enough sins of my own to recognize that God is just to bring hardship and trouble into my life. And to humble me through these circumstances. But nonetheless, if we are patient, if we rest in the Lord, if we recognize His justice and humbly submit ourselves to His discipline, the Lord will plead our case and uphold our cause, even before those who would mock us and accuse us. And then He will bring us out into the light. That's the great hope of the people of God. God will deliver us and bring us into His heavenly city. At that time, my enemy will see it and will be covered with shame. She who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her downfall. She'll be trampled under foot. Micah sees the exaltation of the people of God, their deliverance from sin, their triumph in that heavenly city, and the collapse of the city of man. She who once boasted of her wealth, her security, her political connections, the effectiveness of her pragmatic solutions, will find that it's all a house of cards and it will come to a crashing conclusion. But the people of God who rest in God's provision, who rest in the Christ, know that they will rise in Christ. He is their light. And they have a secure city in which they will dwell. God will be with us forever and ever. And even in the circumstances of this life, we rise up. We don't fall down and get discouraged. We rise up and we fight. We pursue righteousness and godliness in our community. We continue to preach faith in Christ. We continue to proclaim the Word of God. We rise up. We don't fall down. We don't give up. We have God at work within us. The risen Christ is at work in you. So let's be faithful and continue to look to our God, even in difficult, difficult circumstances. He will be our light and our salvation. Let's pray. Father, we pray that your lesson would be on us as we sometimes look at the world around us and grow quite discouraged at the rampant corruption and unbelief that surrounds us, even in places where we would hope to find a, a godly community. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would strengthen us to be faithful to you, be faithful to your word, to wait and hope for your provision. We pray that you would bless us and grant us your resurrection power. We ask it in Christ's name. Let's respond to God's mercies to us by bringing before Him the morning times and the morning.
thank you for the many ways in which you've done good to us. We pray that you would help us to respond by living for you, giving ourselves and our offerings to you for your glory and praise. And we pray that you would bless these offerings uh, to your glory. We ask it in Christ's name. Our response of reading this morning, we will look at Psalter selection number 29 at the back of your hymnal. Selection number 29. And we'll read uh, Psalm 62 from that selection. Selection 29. And we're just going to read from Psalm 62. We have that psalm also before me, or behind me on the screen. Let's read through the psalm responsibly. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault a man? Would, you, would all of you throw him down, this leaning wall, this tottering fence? Before you to him from his lofty place, Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. He alone is my God and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in Him. Low-born men are but a breath, the high-born are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing. Together, they are only a breath. One thing God has spoken, two things have I heard, that you, O God, are strong. And that you, O Lord, are loving, surely you will reward each person according to what he has done. Let's turn to our Lord and confess to him our sins and seek his word of forgiveness. Father in heaven, we thank you for this psalm in which we reflect on your goodness, that you are a God who is powerful and a God who is loving. We come before you through Jesus Christ and confess to you our sins. We confess not in fear, but in faith, knowing that Christ has died for us. His blood has been shed for us for the remission of our sins. We grieve over the presence of sin in our lives, the impact it has had upon our, our hearts, our minds, our consciences, and the impact it has had on our relationships within our families, within our church, within our community at large. We pray, O oh God, that you would forgive us for our many sins. We pray that you would forgive us for walking in darkness rather than in the light. We pray that you would strengthen us by your Spirit, that we might follow Christ by faith and serve Him more faithfully. We ask it in His name. Amen. We are reminded of God's readiness to forgive in these words from the Apostle John's first letter. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. And if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin.
my privilege as an minister of the gospel to present to you this communion, this communion meal, which we celebrate our communion with Christ and our participation in the benefits of this cross. As we approach the meal, we are reminded that the bread represents his broken body and the cup is shed blood, shed for us, for the remission of our sins. As we come to the table, we should evaluate whether we are worthy recipients of this communion meal. Are we walking with the Lord? Are we trusting in Him? Do we daily seek His blessing, seek His forgiveness, His guidance in life? We should repent of our sins, turn from them, and rest in God's provision in Christ and the work of His Spirit in us. If we are not walking with the Lord, if we are uh, retaining sin in our hearts, then we should not approach this table until we have dealt with that sin and repented of it. Let's pray and seek the Lord's blessing on our communion. Father in heaven, we pray that as we approach this meal, that your spirit would bless us to our hearts through faith. Pray that you would embrace Christ and his benefits, that we would know the forgiveness of our sins through his death on our behalf, that we would know that we are joined to him, that we are one body, one people of God, one community of faith. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would strengthen us by uh, this meal. Bless the bread and the cup, that we would grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples as I, ministering in his name, give this bread to you. same manner, our Savior also took the cup, and having given thanks, as has been done in His name, He gave it to His disciples, as I am ministering in His name, give this cup to you.
Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Let's pray. We thank you, O Lord, for this communion meal whereby we are, are feeding on Christ and his benefits. We pray that we strengthen our faith that we would know that we are His, and that we can call upon Him in our time of need. We pray for Your blessing on us and that You strengthen us. We pray that You bless us too as we consider those who are needy as well. And we ask for Your help in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we'd like to take up an offering to uh, consider the needs of those who are uh, may become uh, in need. So, Scott, we take up the act of offering this time. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.